welcome. For those of you that don't know the Oxford Martin School, I encourage you to look at our website. Uh, we're a group now of um, around 300 plus academics across the university doing research on the big challenges of the future. Uh, we always try and be innovative, and the seminar series this term uh, is an experiment, so we look forward to your feedback at the end uh, of this term as to whether you'd like us to repeat this or go back to our old format, or perhaps even better still, try something different uh, in the next time we do this. And I want to do want to thank Alison uh, Stubby and the team that have put this together. It's required a little bit more work, I think, than the, the usual uh, seminars, because instead of having one person uh, each week, we're having uh, four uh, every second week. So don't come next week, there won't be a seminar here. We're having panels uh, every second week this term, and the details are outside. But I do encourage you to come back for all of them. The idea of this series is to think about the frontiers of technology and their application. So what's happening out there on the frontier of technology? Uh, how will it ch shape the way that society operates? To what extent will it help us deal with some of the biggest challenges of the 21st century? And what are some of the other issues associated with this? Uh, technology is often driven by scientists or others who are principally thinking about how to make it work, but also trying to think about the regulatory issues, the government's issues, uh, the economic issues, the social implications, and some of perhaps the negative uh, other sides, underbellies of these uh, technological advances to have a more holistic view of this progress and its application and how it may be used. Uh, and also, hopefully, therefore, to inform the science as it goes forward uh, to make it better and more effective in dealing with the problems. So that's the aim of the series. We'll work out at the end uh, whether we've succeeded. Uh, and the first one we have today, I'm actually delighted to introduce in a minute. But before I do, let me also draw your attention to another seminar series uh, that we're running this term, which is also on very big science uh, trying to solve uh, global problems, which is on geoengineering. So these are attempts to use science, uh, atmospheric science, biological science, other science to deal with some of the issues around climate change. So the series on the science, governance and ethics of climate intervention techniques uh, is also taking place this term and that will start, again you need to look at the schedule because it's a slightly different one, the first is on the 1st of February, the second on the 6th of February and the third on the 8th of February uh, on that. And again, our website has a continual stream of all the events here, so I encourage you to look at our events page on our website. Today I'm delighted to welcome uh, four really great panellists. Uh, they each constrained to ten minutes to think about this. The first is uh, Sonia Contera. Sonia uh, leads our group on nanotechnology and nano for medicine. Uh, she's been a very active advocate of a better understanding of the emerging sciences amongst the public uh, and has engaged in many high-level forums, uh, working on the interface of biology, physics, chemistry and engineering. So she'll talk about some of the risks and opportunities of nanomedicine. She'll be followed by Lionel Tarasenko. Uh, Lionel is a professor and director of the Institute of Biomedical Engineering in Oxford and also the chair of Electrical Engineering. Uh, he's just been awarded in the New, York New Year Honours by Her Majesty uh, CBE for services to engineering, so congratulations uh, publicly for that, and uh, working on really fascinating new diagnostic and other systems in biomedical engineering. Uh, Dinah Sullivan is the Global Research and Development Manager for M Health Solutions at Vodafone. Uh, she's working with Vodafone to think of new ways uh, of using new technologies to deal with some of the major issues um, in medical technologies and also to improve the availability of anti-malarial drugs. So they are the three presenters and then we're going to have a uh, discussant who hopefully will raise some of the difficult issues associated with this, who's Angela Saini. Angela is a freelance science journalist, author of Geek Nation and one of the independent, which was one of the independent newspaper's best books of 2011. She writes widely on science uh, and is really a good um, critical mind on many of these issues, so we believe that she will stimulate that. So they'll take together uh, a maximum of 40 minutes. We have a, perhaps a little bit of discussion amongst them and then we'll open it up. So we'll begin with you, Sonia. Thank you. <coughs> so 
So I'm a physicist working in nanotechnology and I'm going to talk to you about why we are starting to hear these days about this new word, or perhaps less new word now, nanomedicine. So what has to do nanotechnology with medicine? Um, so just to start, a nanometer is a billionth of a meter, so it's roughly that sort of proportion between a little bowl of tea or rice and the diameter of the earth, but that doesn't say very much apart from the fact that a nanometer is very small. What it actually says is that if you put a nanometer in comparison to living things, for example, that are nanometer size, so the diameter of DNA is two nanometers, a typical protein diameter is three to 10 nanometers, viruses are 100 nanometers. So that's one of the most interesting things of nanotech, that is a convergence, is the convergence of science, of sizes. So biology somehow happens at the nanoscale. Scientists and material scientists have been increasingly and engineers getting close to the nanoscale. And we are at the point now that we have the tools and the materials to start to manipulate matter, control matter at the nanoscale, and indeed start to make that nanoscale matter interact with biological system. And that's why nanomedicine. So what does nanotechnology do in biology and in medicine? So the first thing that nanotech can do is that it can give you the tools to study this biology in the scale where it happens at the single molecule level, at the bi um, biological nanometer scale. So we can, these nanotech microscopes allow us to study, for example, DNA and proteins, not just like cartoons or chemicals, but actually let us see you moving. These are images from which one of these nano AFMs, they're called atomic force microscopes, nanomicroscopes that allow you to see in proteins, these are proteins moving, like they're living, uh, like in the living systems. So we are moving from cartoons, as we used to have in the biological text, to pictures and materials and machines that allow you to interact with proteins, with DNA, and of course allow you to see what happens with this matter at the nanoscale and what would happen if you add some nanoparticles to them. So these new techniques allow us to study biology from a different point of view. We don't only get pictures, but we can interact with biological systems. We can pull them, press them, and for the most interesting part, maybe we can have new ideas about thinking about therapeutics and diagnostics. Perhaps it's not only chemistry that we need to target with medicine, but perhaps we could, we could target things like mechanics. So nanotech brings new materials, new ideas, and new techniques. And as I said at the beginning, the fun of nanotech is nanoparticles have roughly the same size as very important biological systems. So what is happening in nanotech now in medicine? I'll, I'll go very quickly to some of the applications that are starting to happen in the labs. Some labs are creating nanoparticles that are able to, for example, and that's the target, that's the future, that we will be able to see and find uh, tumors in the body, so the drugs, for example, chemotherapy, can be loaded in the tumor and not all over your body, so you could reduce very much the chemotherapy, making it more effective. Some people are creating sensors, increasingly sensitive, we are reaching the level of single molecule detection in very small sensors. So that means in the future we will be able to, for example, tattoo a sensor or implant a sensor in your body so you can follow your chemicals. And in, of course, the target would be to load that information, for example, in a mobile phone. So you, you can control your health and, for example, a doctor can control it at, the, at a distance. <coughs> One of the things I work on and I'm more interested in is in tissue engineering and how nanotechnology can help with that. So these are roughly cells in the body. They're not just like that. They're in embedded in this mesh. It's this nano mesh that we have in the body that is called the extracellular matrix. So cells communicate at the nanometer scale. And when you have something like a big accident or a big cut, or it can be due to cancer or whatever, you, you have uh, problems in this extracellular matrix. You lose the nano information. So what we're doing is to create materials at the nanoscale that could substitute for this extracellular matrix and it could help tissues to regenerate. People are thinking of nanotech for regenerating or indeed making contacts between neurons. One of the things we are learning with these nanotechniques is that for neurons to communicate it's much easier to do it if you put them in a conductive mesh. So some people are making little meshes with carbon nanotubes that conduct electricity and they're seeing that uh, neurons can communicate and of course this offers interesting perspectives in the same for uh, spinal cord injuries. 
Some people are using these meshes, for example, for creating cancer vaccines in plants that they have put in mice and they put them under the skin and they train the immune system of mice to actually attack cancer cells. And there's starting to be the first nanotech products in the market for medicine, as I said at the beginning, for regenerating bones. In this case, there's dressings for wounds that have been used in the Iraq war by soldiers to prevent infection and actually help the healing through a nano mesh. There are drugs that can be put in your, in your body through the skin, and I have found even some nanoparticles that are used for detoxification, so they suck poisons when people swallow poisons, etc., etc. So, the future of nanomedicine will probably not be the nanobots that have become famous in the field, but we think in the field that, as I said before, they will be used for regenerating tissues, for imaging, so we will put nanoparticles in the body that will help MRI and they will help to detect different things in the body in a very precise way. They will be used in bone regeneration, in biosensing, and indeed, we think they will be used perhaps in curing things like Alzheimer's. So, because of that convergence of the biological size with nanomaterials, uh, we, we are absolutely sure that nanotech will increasingly be introduced in, the, in medicine. This will bring a lot of problems, and there will be, of course, ethical problems, but of course it will bring the problem of toxicity. One of the things we're very worried in our field right now is what is the effect of all these nanoparticles to the body, and many of us are starting now before it's too late to address this question. So with this, I finish my presentation. Thanks very much, Sonny. Um, I could talk about lots of things. I want to talk about one thing, partly because it's been in the news, and two of my slides will be direct quotes from the Financial Times and the Daily Mail this week. Um, something which has also been very uh, prominent in this country since last November when uh, David Cameron, Prime Minister, uh, held a press conference to launch the um, NHS Innovation Report and announced that within five years, three million people uh, would be uh, using telehealth in Britain. Um, and there are issues surrounding that. Is it a real realistic proposition? Now, whether or not it is a realistic proposition, we're going to have to have some form of telehealth, it, whether we like it or not. Um, healthcare spend has outpaced GDP growth by about 2% in, in most um, developed countries, OECD countries, for the last 50 years. And the worst culprit, of course, uh, is the US. And you can see these diverging lines, and that is just not sustainable. It's not sustainable in the US, it's not sustainable in the UK, the amount that we actually spend as a proportion of our um, national product, our gross domestic product, on healthcare. So one has to do something about it. And one of the areas is uh, the area of chronic disease management. So chronic diseases are uh, conditions that you have for life. There are no cures at the moment for diabetes, asthma, high blood pressure, which is hypertension, chronic heart failure. <coughs> um, respiratory diseases are usually lumped into what is called chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. These have to be managed. There is treatment, there is no cure. And if you look at the previous graph, 80% of the growth is accounted for by these chronic diseases or long-term conditions. So we have to do something about it because the spend is horrendous. They're not niche areas. It's 17 and a half million people in this country. It's nine billion pounds on a year that the NHS spends on treating diabetes and its complications. And your GP spends four days out of five dealing with patients with chronic diseases or the consequences of inflammations or exacerbations of these diseases. Um, and they use about 60% of hospital days. So uh, it is a major problem. And there is some sort of solution which has been really under development for about a decade now in, in the developed world. Uh, there are also uh, parallel developments in the developing world, but we'll have time to address that maybe um, later on in the discussion time, and maybe Diane will touch upon that. Um, I'm concentrating on um, developed world countries for today. And it's the idea of trying to keep people at home and avoid the most expensive part of healthcare is when you end up in hospital. So um, roughly speaking, um, 
and it is orders of magnitude, don't quote me on the figures, they vary up and down. It's about uh, a thousand pounds a day for a bed in a general ward, uh, two to three thousand pounds for bed in intensive care. So, very expensive. If we could keep people away from hospital, you know, detecting early when they're about to deteriorate, for example, let's just take COPD, uh, you can take um, um, oral antibiotics when exacerbation develops, which means that uh, you will avoid um, the unplanned hospital mission where you are probably treated with um, intravenous antibiotics. So early detection through remote monitoring of patients is a way to keep those costs down uh, and has the advantage that the patient stays better um, and uh, doesn't have the complications of going to hospital, for example, hospital required infections. And it is well known without going into the details that we are talking about potentially uh, efficiency savings of billions of pounds by deploying telehealth on a large scale. As I mentioned, reduction in avoidable hospital emissions and also reductions in emergency visits to your GP. Now, if you work uh, with medics, and that's where I was till about 40 minutes ago, you have to create the evidence. There is a myth out there that there is no evidence to support telehealth. These are just the studies that we've done. Um, and for example, we've been uh, involved with the one in red at the bottom here, where we supplied some mobile phone technology for uh, the demonstrator in, in uh, East London, and this is what the Prime Minister was referring to uh, at his press conference. So we've done about 20 studies which have been published, uh, which have been peer-reviewed, and so the evidence is building up. Um, and the 16 clinical trials which have now been published, I won't go through these in detail unless um, there are people here in the audience who want to go through, but the take-home message is for all of these conditions, diabetes, asthma, COPD, hypertension, there was an improvement in patient outcome. These were proper um, clinical trials. Some of them were randomized controlled trials. Others were step wedge designed. Some of them were observational studies, properly constructed, went through medical research ethics, and we reported positive outcomes. So there is evidence out there that telehealth does work. So the technology does work. It is acceptable across the age spectrum. We've been at this about eight years, patients like using telehealth. The reassurance it provides, they know there's somebody at the other end who will detect um, if they're beginning to deteriorate. And as I say, we've demonstrated improved health outcomes across a range of conditions. So that's the positive points. How about the, the difficulties, the, some things that we might want to discuss in the discussion time? One of the things is, here's this brand new technology. It's really about a decade, maybe 15 years old and so on. And all of a sudden, you're saying, OK, we're going to manage patients differently. They're going to have some form of technology in the home. It's going to be linked via the web to the respiratory nurses, maybe. Or should it be the respiratory consultant? Or should it be the GP? Who's going to look at the screen when? And that's true whether it's um, uh, respiratory diseases, heart failure, diabetes, etc. So you have to integrate the technology. Technology in its own is not enough. It has to be integrated to clinical pathways. And it requires new ways of working by healthcare professionals. So I did one of these meetings about uh, two months ago, before Christmas, with a bunch of GPs. And one of them said, don't want to know about telehealth. I'm just not interested at all. It's just going to mean changing the way of your patients. I'm not prepared to do it. In the end, after a lot of discussion, it emerged that this person, being a GP for 30 years, actually did telephone triage. He would never have thought of phoning or speaking to a patient on the phone 30 years ago when he started. Now, with that telephone triage, he couldn't run his practice and manage the caseload that he manages. So there are ways that even people who may be um, a priori against technology um, can be brought along, and you have to work out ways of integrating this within uh, clinical pathways. But that is quite demanding, and we can talk about that. It's all about not just changing patient behavior, but also healthcare professional behavior. And the last point I want to address, because I thought it might raise some um, discussion time, I, I was speaking at the Times uh, Cheltenham Science Festival last June, and I had hardly finished speaking that somebody in the back, so I don't know whether you're sitting in the back as well, was up on their feet, haranguing me about uh, uh, electronic health records, the fact the government wants to keep tabs on everybody, and this has been played out in the press again this week with a company that um, uh, Diana know, know well. Um, in my lab, we're actually the first people in the UK to have tested this patch technology. This is a patch that allows you to do two things, monitor the patient's vital signs, and also, if the right silicon 
uh, ingestible uh, silicon sensor has been uh, put into the medication the patient's taking, track when they're taking their medication. So you can actually tag pills uh, and track medication adherence. Um, for each sensor per pill, it's of the order of, of um, uh, 0.1 of a dollar, and, and the patch will eventually be of the order of a dollar or more. And it does work. We've tried it in hospital, as I say, we're the first people to try it in the UK um, in hospital, and the technology does work. But what happened today is that, um, and this is verbatim quotes from the F Financial Times, Lloyd's Pharmacy has signed a deal with Proteus Biomedical to sell pills containing edible microchips that communicate with disposable monitoring uh, patch that you saw on the previous uh, slide. That was uh, in the first paragraph of Financial Times, and then it went to, however, it could also raise concerns over privacy um, and raise its prospect for greater two-tiered provision of healthcare, etc. First concern. Second concern in the Daily Mail, uh, there is a civil liberties group called Big Brother Watch, um, and raise concerns about patient privacy, etc. Um, patients should be able to see a full breakdown of what data is captured and who it is accessed by. Now, one of the problems is a lot of this comment is often ill-informed or not informed at all. So I shall finish with my last slide telling you what we're doing, which is deploying this technology on a large scale within the NHS. There's a convergence of computing, phones and so on, and the next speaker um, uh, would be able to tell you more about that, but really effectively notebook that the gentleman's using here at the front could have a SIM and it could be like a tab tablets, not medication tablets, but iPads being an example, uh, mobile phones, notebook computers, all converging to one technology. We can actually adapt this to make it useful for uh, more elderly patients by having big icons on the screen. We've got a large amount of funding from the Department of Health, uh, the Wellcome Trust, etc., to really design this for scale. Now, one of the things that we've done right from the start is thought, where does the data go? The data goes behind the NHS firewall in what we're going to call a remote patient web service. The patient grants access control to healthcare professionals, even the healthcare professional. Their self-monitoring data, he or she can agree whether the GP sees it, the respiratory nurse, the consultant in the hospital, carers and relative. It's all under patient control. So I think, and I could obviously say a lot more, but my time is 10 minutes, the debate about the role of telehealth and the whole role of electronic health records in the 21st century needs to be balanced and informed. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Lionel. You've nicely set up a lot of the things I will be discussing in my 10-minute slot. So um, I'm the global head of R&D in a team that we call M Health Solutions in Vodafone Global Enterprise. And so um, I'd like to start by um, thinking about the, the revolution that the mu music industry has gone through. I think this needs no explanation. It's something that all of us are very familiar with. We've gone from using multiple ways of consuming music, right down to pretty much, I think, uh, most of us now use iPods. So, will the healthcare industry go through a similar revolution? And um, again, much as Lionel's explained, are we going to move from what is an essentially um, an acute care model at the moment down to one that is a, more of a chronic care model whereby people are empowered to better take care of their own health themselves and what devices they might need to do that. Um, and there is indeed lots of convergence around that device and certainly lots of interest from companies like mine about how we enable that better patient empowerment of their own health care. And just a few headlines from this week. Again, I've also chosen the Daily Mail uh, headline. <laughs> and um, what's very interesting about the, the media age that we're living in is to look at the comments section behind these headlines and almost exclusively negative. Now, I must admit, I only looked at the Daily Mail ones, but it's um, very interesting to see that the immediate knee-jerk backlash that there can be from these technologies, which you know often is very justified. And so, suffice to say that um, Vodafone, obviously, is a company that um, has commercial interests, and health is one of the big five growth areas. And this surprises a lot of people when they hear this. 
um, we have other things that we're looking at as well, but um, we have quite a big team of people looking at m -Health now. And we've been trying to do this for about 10 years. Um, admittedly, recently ramped up our efforts, because um, the current climate and world situation and the healthcare challenges that we're dealing with are very different, but it's certainly something that we as a company have been battling away with for about 10 years. And so in terms of real life implementations, we divide the solution areas up into five categories. Now I won't go through any of these now, but um, it's just to give you a feeling for the sort of broad application that mobile technology can have in healthcare. And the, the ones that spring to mind first and foremost, of course, are the, the long-term condition management of, of people in their own homes. But um, a really important area to us that I want to talk to you today is, is in the area of, of access to medicine, which is not something that would immediately spring to mind. And I'm going to wow you with the art of what you can do with, with basic mobile technology, I hope. Because um, in countries like Tanzania, they have very little infrastructure in anything, let alone healthcare. But what they do have is a mobile telecoms in infrastructure. And so what we've done is worked with the Tanzania Ministry of Health to try to help them fix the problem they have with anti-malarial drug stockouts. They know that they have enough drug arriving into country, but then as soon as it arrives in the central airport in Dar es Salaam, they have no visibility of where the drugs are. And um, there's a, a huge number of childhood deaths simply because the drugs aren't getting to the right place at the right time. So to better explain this, I'd like to show you a short video and hope the technology works. I, have, I don't have sound, but we don't need sound, it's got, it's in Swahili anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> It's a shame because there's some nice music behind it. So anyway, well, um, it's not running too smoothly, but I'll cut that because it's not it's a bit jumpy. So what the video goes on to say is that once a week, a simple text message of drugstock levels is sent to our central database repository that we compile into a, a meaningful way so that the district medical officer can see where he's having stock outs, where the trends are, and deploy the drugs to the right place at the right time. And to Lionel's point about behavioural change, it's of course it's about um, enacting behavioural change in the patients, but in our case with the medical professionals, very simply, how do we incentivize them to give us the drug stock levels every week? Very simple, we give them a month's worth of airtime as soon as they send the stock levels through. And lo and behold, we have 100% compliance with the stock levels. And we've gone from, at any given time, about 25% of, of the health posts had no antimalarial drugs, down to zero across the whole of Tanzania. And this is something we're really proud of and just goes to show what you can do with text messaging. And that's it for me. Um, I'm the token journalist, which means that I'm supposed to give society's viewpoint or what the public think, which I guess from the scientific perspective is usually they don't really know what they're talking about or they don't understand stuff very well. Um, I, want, I read an essay recently, which actually is from 1966, written by Alvin Weinberg, who's a nuclear physicist. Um, passed away sadly. Um, he um, worked on the Manhattan Project and he wrote this essay um, about how society accepts new technologies um, and he talked about the technological fix. So this idea that um, we seem so obsessed or wedded to this idea that it's possible to create a technology that can solve our biggest problems in one go. And when the nuclear bomb was created, there were scientists who believed that, or even politicians who believed that this could be the end of war. Here was a technology so destructive, so huge and immense, that um, no country would ever use it, and that would place this stalemate on war forever, and you wouldn't have any conflict anymore. Of course, it didn't pan out that way. But there are lots of examples of this throughout history, of 
drugs and technologies and pieces of research that are supposed to fix things in a big way. And I think in healthcare technology, that's, that's what we're hoping for. We're hoping that in the future, we won't need this archaic system of doctors and hospitals, which is very cost intensive and very labor intensive, that maybe there are technologies out there that will fix everything for us. And for my part, given what history has taught us, is that even if this technological fix isn't what it turns out to be, at the very least, it can offer us something. It may provide a short-term solution or a stopgap or some kind of intermediate solution. Um, and it will be interesting, I think, to see what nanotechnology will bring, <clears throat> what genetics will bring, what mobile healthcare <coughs> will bring. Um, the thing is, when science meets society, it's not always the way... It doesn't always meet it in the way that scientists would want it to meet it. So th this week, for example, I've been working on an article on engineering ethics, and um, I met a social scientist at King's College London who um, has been embedded with scientists trying to look at the work they're doing in synthetic biology. So this is a very young field um, in which um, biologists and engineers come together to look at ways in which we can solve very, very big problems using devices made out of biological parts. Um, and it's ethically quite contentious. Um, and the roadblock she comes across again and again with scientists is that they don't, um, they don't always accept that society might not always be educated enough or people may not you know, know enough about the technology to accept it the, the, the way that they would want to take it. And um, it's her experience in genetic engineering that has taught her that. So she's been working in GM crops since the early days of GM crops. And she says that even now, researchers, when she goes to them and says, why is it that in Europe we are still so against GM crops? Why can we still not grow them? Whereas in other countries they can. And researchers still say to her, it's because of the public. The public are ignorant. They just don't know the facts about the, the case. And maybe that's true. That is likely to be true, that maybe the public aren't educated. But that doesn't mean the public's concerns aren't valid and that we need to understand them. The truth is that we won't get everybody to understand the scientific facts the way that researchers understand them. But scientists need to go quite a lot of the way to make sure that these technologies are developed such that we can, um, they are acceptable, that they can get integrated into policy, that they can get integrated into society in a way that's acceptable to everyone. And that's, it's, it's good that that's happening now. In nanotech, that's actually happening in a way that it didn't happen in genetic engineering. And I would hope that in mHealth and in um, other novel healthcare solutions, that, that also happens. But it's a hard process, and it does take some meeting in the middle. And even though it's very easy to laugh at Daily Mail headlines, and we journalists do that too, um, we do also have to be careful about the way that we communicate and present research. Great. Thanks very much, Angela. I'm going to just give um, the panellists a, a minute or two if they want to, to ask each other questions before we, we open it up. I don't know if any of you have anything you want to post to each other. Can I answer to something that yeah, she absolutely. just said before? Well, I must say that nanotechnologies, actually, we are very aware of this problem. And one of the things that we think a lot is how are we going to step, uh, stop ourselves from becoming in a situation where the technology cannot progress. So many of us are actually thinking of how are ways of engaging the public. Or actually, the Oxford Martin School is a very good place to do these things. And in, in our new proposals for funding for research, we are actually, engage, actually actively putting public engagement in, in actually asking the public what research questions they want us to look at. So. We know this. <laughs> yeah, no, I, there is, in synthetic biology and in nanotechnology, there are fields that have learned from the mistakes that have gone before and integrated ethics quite in quite an early stage. Um, but that doesn't stop people from being afraid. No, of course it? not. <laughs> and of course it's a big challenge how to move that into yeah. something meaningful. Just a couple of points, if I may, Mr Chairman. It, I think healthcare is slightly different. It affects everybody. Uh, but the other thing is that you've always got to ask yourself when you work in healthcare technologies, which is what today's topic discussion is, are you meeting an unmet clinical need? I thought, how could anybody object to, for example, SMS for life that Vodafone have deployed in Tanzania, you know, 
malaria drug stockouts going down from 25% almost to zero. That is meeting a need in the field that isn't being met by current technology. Um, there are examples of other healthcare technologies where you are able to do something you couldn't do otherwise. Um, so is it meeting an unmet clinical need? That's the first question I think we should educate the public. Technology for technology's sake, I agree, all sorts of objections, but if it's meeting a need that cannot be met in any other way, then I think already that, that would help the public understand why the, the healthcare technology is being developed. And secondly, I, I have no problems with the opponents of GMOs or nanotechnology and so on uh, being reported. It's just actually asking journalists to do balanced reporting. You know, it seemed to me, I didn't just put the Daily Mail, Financial Times was just as bad, um, and that's meant to be an educated broadsheet. Present the technology, by all means talk to somebody who raises concerns, but then also talk to somebody who could explain what the technology could actually do for you. I mean, I'll just give you one example, electronic health records, you know. It's all about, will insurance companies get hold of your data? There are lots of protections. Um, you know, you try and access an NHS computer through VPN and so on, incredibly difficult. Um, it, behind the NHS firewall, things, electronic health records are very safe. Um, and so that's one way to answer the privacy. But how often do you see in an article said, you turn up at a and &E having just had a stroke and your blood pressure is 180 millimeters of mercury? Now, if I know from your electronic health record that your normal blood pressure is 110 millimeters of mercury it's systolic, I will treat you, or not I, but my stroke um, uh, clinician colleagues, will treat you completely different from somebody who's normal blood pressure, systolic blood pressure is 160, 170. A mild elevation of blood pressure is completely different in the context of a stroke to a very significant. Now, your electronic health record will tell the A&E clinicians um, whether you're, you're normal tensive or hypertensive before you have a stroke. It could be the difference between life and death. I have never seen this example given in any article by journalists about electronic health records. So all we're pleading for is actually balanced reporting. Okay, let's, uh, let's have a discussion.